My name is Raymond Wiesick. I am the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy with the International Myeloma Foundation. I will be presenting to you today on the need for this legislation to provide benefits for an estimated 90,000 Blue Water Navy veterans, how the legislation works, and some of the recent challenges to its passage. I am an attorney, having graduated from Tulane Law School in 2011, and I've been with the IMF for the last four years. I did briefly leave the IMF in the winter of 2016 to spend eight weeks Marine OCS in Quantico before an unfortunate injury ended my brief military career. I have spent the last year revising the Veterans Against My Loma program within the IMF to better serve the veteran community. Our guest speaker today will be retired United States Navy Rear Admiral Paul Becker, who is currently the president and CEO of the Becker T3 Group a business consultancy designed to improve organizational and personal performance, productivity, and profit by focusing on the core leadership principles of teamwork, tone, and tenacity. Paul is a Distinguished Service Medal recipient, and at the time of his retirement was the Director for Intelligence for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Paul was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in 2014. Welcome, Paul. I am quite honored to have you speak with us today. Our webinar will have three basic learning objectives. First, to provide information on the eligibility for Blue Water Navy Vietnam veterans as it relates to benefits for exposure to the chemicals collectively known as Agent Orange, specifically on how the eligibility for those veterans have changed over the years. Second, to explain the current state of affairs for Blue Water Navy Vietnam veterans, including how the current bill would provide new benefits for those veterans, who opposes the bill's passage, and the current outlook for the legislation. Finally, I hope the webinar will move you to take action in support of the Blue Water Navy Vietnam Veterans Act of 2017, and I will explain to you how you can do so. Now, we've reached the point where I need to advise you that the following two slides will contain mention and images of the Vietnam War. Please walk away from your computer if you would like to avoid those mentions and return when you see the slide titled Agent Orange Act of 1991. And so to begin, we're going to take a brief look at how and why service members were exposed to the chemicals in Agent Orange. I'm not going to go into great detail since many of you live this, but I do want to highlight a few key points. In 1961, the president of South Vietnam requested the assistance of the U.S. in spraying herbicides to kill vegetation that both fed and concealed North Vietnamese fighters. President Kennedy approved the plan, which became known as Operation Ranch Hand. It's estimated that over 20 million gallons of various chemicals were sprayed between 1962 and 1971, 11 million of which consisted of Agent Orange. The term Agent Orange itself comes from the orange stripes in the barrels containing chemicals like dioxin. The spray fell mostly on the forests of South Vietnam, although some spilt over into Laos. U.S. servicemen on the ground were unknowingly exposed to high doses of these chemicals, often being told the chemicals were harmless. A quarter of those exposed have presented with serious medical side effects, including higher instances of myeloma. As we know today, troops on the ground were not the only ones exposed. U.S. Naval and Coast Guard operations were conducted within the territorial seas of Vietnam, also referred to as Blue Water, hence where we get the name Blue Water Navy Vietnam Veteran. This would include aircraft carriers conducting bombing runs and pilot rescue throughout the war, support ships conducting bombardment and surveillance activities close to shore, and transport ships that were used to load and offload cargo from the country. Some of these transport ships actually docked at deep water harbors such as Da Nang, which we'll get to later. Other service members were also exposed to dioxin, such as C-123 aircraft crews and maintainers, warehouse shippers, and warehouse loaders. If a ship was not directly exposed through the air or through shipping barrels of Agent Orange, the water distillation machinery in Royal Australian Navy ships during the time period was found to magnify the strength of chemicals in dioxin-tainted seawater during a 2002 study. The same equipment was present on U.S. naval vessels during the Vietnam War. It's been argued that U.S. Navy ships were directed to only take on water beyond 12 miles from shore, thereby greatly reducing the chance of taking on tainted seawater, but there's no indication that these orders were or were not strictly followed. In 1977, only a few years following the end of the war, the Department of Veteran Affairs began to receive Benvik claims related to Agent Orange exposure. At the time, each case required documented proof of exposure in relation to service, often with a medical opinion for the disease being requested for coverage. This led to many denied claims, and many veterans were angered at the difficulty in receiving benefit coverage. The outcry from veterans and the public led to the passage of the Agent Orange Act of 1991 in an effort to make Agent Orange claims easier for veterans. The bill passed quickly and unanimously, having been introduced in January and signed into law by President George H.W. Bush in February of the same year. The act stated that certain diseases tied to chemical exposure would be presumed related to a veteran's military service and therefore make them eligible for benefits without proof of exposure. 
At the time of its passing, only three diseases were named, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, soft tissue sarcoma, and a skin disease, chloraxine. In 1994, the VA expanded presumption to multiple myeloma. Blue Water Navy veterans who served within the territorial waters of Vietnam received presumptive exposure status for Agent Orange under this legislation as the bill made no distinction between Vietnam-era veterans. It stated, for the purposes of this subsection, a veteran who, during active military, naval, or air service, served in the Republic of Vietnam during the Vietnam era and has a disease referred to in this paragraph, 1B, of this subsection shall be presumed to have been exposed during such service to an herbicide agent containing dioxin and may be presumed to have been exposed during such service to any other chemical compound in an herbicide agent unless there is affirmative evidence to establish that the veteran was not exposed to any such agent during that service. In 2002, based on a VA report that found there was insufficient evidence to connect health problems of Blue Water veterans with chemical exposure aboard ships, the VA narrowed the definition of Vietnam veteran under the Agent Orange Act of 1991 to, and I quote, someone who actually served on land in the Republic of South Vietnam, end quote. For the purposes of herbicide exposure, that eliminated previously eligible veterans whose feet did not touch the soil of South Vietnam or a dock or a pier that can be considered an extension of the land. This effectively ended compensation for thousands of Blue Water veterans who had already been receiving care and benefits. In 2008, a federal appeals court upheld the denial of benefits, but a 2015 court decision found the 2002 ruling by the VA to be arbitrary and capricious, a legal term that means the ruling was made without considering the facts of the matter. This invalidated the VA ruling and required a new rulemaking from the VA. Although Blue Water veterans were still excluded from presumptive exposure under the newly promulgated rule, other previously denied groups, such as C-123 veterans, were made eligible. We'll touch more on this in a moment. Currently, Blue Water veterans can only receive coverage if they are able to show exposure, and I quote again, on a factual basis, end quote, meaning that a documented instance of exposure is needed for a successful benefit claim. In April of 2015, the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veteran Claims held in Gray v. McDonald that the VA's interpretation of its regulations was inconsistent when determining whether a harbor was within an inland waterway or offshore, and that the VA totally ignored the issue of whether a harbor was exposed to aerial spraying determining presumptive exposure. This ruling established that several harbors of Vietnam, specifically Da Nang, Cam Ra Bay, and Bung Tau, are within the definition of inland waterways established by the VA and allow veterans whose ships were previously docked in the harbors to receive benefits by providing them with presumptive exposure, even if the sailors themselves were not on the ship at the time those ships were docked, as the harbors themselves were active spray areas. A list of ships and timeline eligibility is available on the VA website. Visit benefits.va.gov, click Compensation, then go to Type of Claims and click Post Service. Finally, click the Agent Orange link. While the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veteran Claims found the 2002 decision by the VA to be arbitrary and capricious, the VA continues to exclude Blue Water Navy veterans from presumptive exposure even after the further rulemaking in 2016. The VA decision to continue to exclude Blue Water veterans is under appeal. Currently, the VA only recognizes veterans for presumptive exposure who have had boots on the ground in Vietnam, traversed the inland waterways of the country, also known as brown water, or served aboard one of the ships that docked in one of three harbors known as the Da Nang exception. If a Blue Water Navy veteran does not meet that criteria, they are eligible for benefits only if they have factually supported exposure to Agent Orange while in service, such as aboard their vessel, or if they were otherwise in or near the Korean demilitarized zone any time between April 1st, 1968 and August 31st, 1971. And now we've come to the bill itself. Identical legislation was introduced in 2017 by Representative David Valadeo in the House and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand in the Senate, which will, if enacted, extend the same presumption of exposure established in the Agent Orange Act of 1991 for those veterans who served aboard naval vessels within 12 nautical miles of Vietnam shore during the war. It would also expand the presumption to include veterans who served in or near the Korean demilitarized zone between September 1, 1967 in April 1, 1968, which is about a year and a half earlier than current law. This is, of course, the Blue Water Navy Vietnam Veterans Act of 2017. On June 25th of this year, H.R. 299 passed the House on a roll call vote of 382 to nothing. Since that bill was passed first, it gets sent to the Senate, who then decide if they want to pass it as is or alter it and send it back to the House to re-vote on the changes. However, it's important to note that the Senate version, S-422, 
has 52 co-sponsors who will likely support the House version, making passage of the House bill more likely. I would like to take a moment to thank both Senator Gillibrand and Representative Valadeo. Whatever your political viewpoint, it's heartening to see a Democrat and Republican reach across the aisle and the chamber to come to the aid of veterans on this issue. The IMF has sent letters of support to both legislators and staffers from both offices who were very helpful in developing this webinar. And if you're listening today, thank you. The bill defines the offshore area in which the vessel must have operated during the time period quite specifically. The coordinates essentially translate to 12 nautical miles from the coast of Vietnam in any direction. However, it might be useful to know exactly where that boundary ends. If you have trouble reading this graph, you can find this information contained within the bill itself by visiting congress.gov and searching for H.R. 299 in the 115th Congress. Senate and House members work together to figure out how to pay for the estimated $1 billion price tag over the next 10 years to cover the Blue Water Navy Vietnam Veterans Act without violating House rules against raising department mandatory spending budget. The funding fee on VA-backed home loans will be increased slightly, from 2.15% to 2.4% on the loan amount for loans with no down payment and first use of the VA guarantee benefit, 3.3% to 3.8% of the loan amount for loans with no down payment on subsequent use of the loan benefit, from 1.5% to 1.75% of the loan amount for loans with a 5% down payment, and from 1.25% to 1.45% of the loan amount for loans with a 10% down payment. The increases would take effect on January 1st of 2019 and return to current levels after September 30th, 2026. The VA funding fee is a one-time fee paid directly to the Department of Veteran Affairs for every VA purchase or refinance loan. The money received from the VA funding fee is used to offset the few loans that go into default and further reduce the cost of taxpayers, ensuring the VA home loan program continues for future generations. VA funding fees were last raised in 2004. The fee would not affect loans to any veterans with disabilities for most loans, which account for about 47% of all VA loans. However, only 100% VA rated disabilities would not have to have any fee for what are known as jumbo loans loans to go above the conforming loan limit. The Freddie Mac conforming loan limit is set currently at $453,100 in most of the county, country, but varies by state or county depending on local housing markets. The conforming loan limit is near $1 million in Hawaii, for example, and $800,000 in Ventura County, California. This is a change for any veterans with 90% rated disabilities or less on large loans, as they will now have to actually pay the fee, whereas they previously did not. Veteran service organizations have found this to be an acceptable increase given the benefit to Blue Water veterans. The Congressional Budget Office found that not only would this plan cover the estimated cost of expanded benefits for Blue Water Navy veterans, but also would produce a $271 million VA budget gain. However, that funding mechanism may now find itself in jeopardy. During a recent Senate hearing on the bill, Senator Isaacson, who worked on the real estate industry prior to taking office, cast doubt that charging veterans an extra $250 on every $100,000 borrowed would cover the cost of care for Blue Water Navy veterans. He noted that the number of loans closed in a year and the amounts are all highly variable and can fluctuate greatly. Other veterans have also expressed displeasure at charging some disabled veterans a fee, even if it's only for jumbo loans. Recently, the VA has come out against this bill, urging for it to be killed in the Senate. The rationale provided centers around a lack of scientific evidence that Blue Water Navy veterans were exposed to dioxin, despite a number of reports about the plausibility and potential pathways for exposure. Just two days following the confirmation of Secretary Wilkie to the Post, Undersecretary for Benefits Paul Lawrence attacked the bill during a meeting with the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction for the Act. But the bill has popular support, and a number of senators have met with Secretary Wilkie over the last month to try and convince him to reverse course as the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs puts a large amount of stock in what the VA has to say. Ultimately, though, it's up to the chairman of the committee, who's actually Senator Isaacson, to decide whether to put the bill up for a vote or not. We'll touch on more about what you can do as patients, caregivers, and advocates to try and move this bill to a vote. But first, I'd like to turn it over to our guest speaker, Rear Admiral Paul Becker, to speak about his experience as a myeloma patient and the importance of these benefits for veterans. Paul, you have the floor. Thank you, Ray. This is just a, a comms check before I begin. Make sure everyone can hear me okay. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, you mentioned I was diagnosed in, in 2014. That's true. I was on active duty at the time. And I'd like to share with the audience, I was the J2 or Director for Intelligence on the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon. I think like most patients who are diagnosed with myeloma or multiple myeloma, it came as a surprise. And 
I spent most of 2015 undergoing several surprises, which included surgeries, procedures, high dose chemotherapy, uh, a stem cell transplant, uh, and then finally, uh, achievement of a remission. And in 2016, I decided to transition out of active duty and I entered the VA benefits system and uh, I've been in a, a good stable remission, receiving my care at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center since. I still receive three monthly treatments uh, of low dose maintenance chemotherapy uh, for my multiple myeloma. And in fact, I, I noticed uh, reading ahead to some of the slides that uh, one of our sponsors for this webinar is the Cell Gene Company. And I received a, a fresh batch uh, of their medicine this morning as well, called pomalidomide or pomalist uh, for short. So I thank them for sponsoring uh, as uh, I do others. Uh, in my four years of treatment, I've met many Vietnam era myeloma, multiple myeloma patients including Blue Water Navy patients. And I think some of the most valuable time I've had as a multiple myeloma patient is sitting either in the treatment room uh, or just in the waiting room and uh, listening and learning from others. And, and that's a, a great tool uh, for understanding where we are and understanding where we need to go. And that's something I found that even though I didn't serve in Vietnam myself, uh, I have in common with Vietnam era multiple myeloma patients. Uh, first, we don't want it, right? But we've got it. Uh, and second, uh, that we have some frustrations uh, in dealing with it, uh, whether it's from uh, the tricky diagnosis uh, of this type uh, of cancer uh, or the intricacies of navigating through the VA or the TRICARE or other private healthcare systems. And that's why webinars like this uh, brought to us by the International Myeloma Foundation, the IMF, uh, is so valuable. Uh, I would share with everyone that IMF is just an incredible resource where I have the opportunity to listen, learn, and on occasion have asked to contribute like this to, to help lead the effort on the way forward. And that's something I'd share with all listeners. Uh, to the degree that you can participate with what the IMF is doing, whether it's online like this, or uh, if there's a support group locally, or many of the multiple nationwide programs, international programs as well, uh, where you can go speak with thought leaders and practitioners and other patients, where you can really absorb the best level of information available to us. Uh, I'm a big information sharer. Uh, I'd rather over communicate than under communicate. And I like that IMF uh, has such a program uh, because no one has any real idea exactly where their voice or their echo of their voice will be heard. And I've received some firsthand and I've received some second and third order effect uh, reports of what the IMF is doing. And it's really helped focus my knowledge as a patient. So when I go to see my providers, uh, I can ask meaningful questions. And sometimes it's about medication and sometimes it's about administrative factors. Uh, even in listening to Ray earlier today, I found out a whole bunch uh, of what's going on with this legislation. And I'll chime in with uh, my representatives uh, to make sure they hear my voice on this. Right, so I, I leave that as a, a lesson for all. When it comes to multiple myeloma, uh, better to over communicate than under communicate, especially because it's been my experience in my limited four plus years of treatment. There are no two myeloma cases that are exactly the same. There's nuance between every one of our cytogenic profile and there's nuance between every one of our treatments. So that's really important. Uh, Ray was very kind to, to highlight that uh, I have a, my own business uh, since I left the Navy called the Becker T3 Group. T3 stands for teamwork, tone, tenacity. And those 
three T's uh, apply to what we're doing as myeloma patients and in the myeloma community with the IMF. The teamwork is uh, about our network and it's not the quantity of people in the network, that's a metric for Facebook or LinkedIn perhaps, but the trust and loyalty that's built up in care groups uh, is fantastic and very useful. The tone uh, of the IMF and, and what we do uh, is one of opportunity versus challenge uh, and uh, also optimism uh, versus other uh, perspectives. And then the tenacity is, is one of a perseverance with a purpose. Uh, the IMF founders uh, and its members are dedicated and tireless. I'm, I'm proud to be amongst them and I'd commend them all to your attention uh, when you have the opportunity to participate with them. And then final thought, Ray and audiences, uh, I've thought about what's the best revenge we can have against myeloma. And I think it's just to live a good a life as we can and give back to others uh, who have this diagnosis or, or other uh, unfortunate circumstances and help them find a way forward as we're benefiting today from listening to you and uh, pointing us in the right direction. So thank you very much for that. And when we get to, to the point when you wrap up, Ray, if the listeners have some additional in questions for me, I'd be happy to chime in with you. All right, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, you know, what you're saying is exactly what we kind of need to pick up with here which is that theme of, uh, of communication. Just I'm going to pull that thread a little bit. Um, and as Paul said, at the end of this webinar, there will be some time for some Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions for Paul or any questions on the legislation, there will be time for that. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and go into what you can do now at this point to take some action. So again, pulling on uh, Paul's thread about the theme of communication, about having the right tone and the tenacity for uh, this, this effort, what you can do is what we always say. You have to call and connect and meet with your, your representatives. In this case, it's actually your senators uh, at this point that you need to con contact, to talk to, um, talk to their staff. And you can do that in a variety of ways. You can email them, you can write them, you can call them. But all of those ways, if you are having trouble with that, you can do through us. You can contact the IMF advocacy team. Uh, you can contact me directly. You can contact all of us, our entire team, which is Danielle, Kelly, Robin, and myself at advocacy at Um And just sharing your stories with the, the, the legislators, with their staffers, and with other veterans within the veteran community really helps buoy the support for this legislation. But when you do contact your leg legislators, and if you have one of these senators and you're in one of these states, these are the people you need to talk to. Because at the moment, this legislation is languishing in the Senate Committee on Veteran Affairs. And unless Chairman Isaacson decides that he's going to hold a hearing on this legislation, hold a vote, it won't move forward. So if you live in Georgia, Kansas, uh, Nevada, uh, Louisiana, South Dakota, Montana, any of these states, these are the senators that you need to contact and push to have a vote held on this legislation. That's the only way this is going to happen. We're running out of time. As you know, uh, the election is in November. There is a lame duck session after the election, and that is really, at this point, uh, pretty close to um, the way that this is going to go if we're going to be able to get a hearing uh, within the committee and, and get a vote. Uh, otherwise, once the new Congress, the 116th Congress, is sworn in at the beginning of the year, this has to start all over again. And we have to start in one chamber or the other and move the legislation forward. We're so close at this point, and we're so, uh, you know, the finish line is within sight. Uh, so much effort and so much work has gone into this legislation, has gone into this issue to try to help those Blue Water Navy Vietnam veterans get the benefits that they deserve and that they need. So, again, if you are from any of these states, please reach out to your senator and tell them that you really do support this legislation. Tell your family members to do so as well. Tell your friends. Let other veterans know. Uh, this is really, again, the only way that you can make your voice heard is by letting them know. Otherwise, they will not uh, know that there's such a groundswell for support. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and go over to questions. I'm going to, again, unmute Paul in case anybody has any questions. I'm just taking a look. If you do have a question, you click on the question box on the right of the sidebar. You uh, can submit it in there and it will pop up. 
Uh, in the meantime, while we wait to see if anybody has any questions, again, here's our contact information, advocacy at myloma.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at IMF Advocacy or find us on Facebook at Advocacy at IMF. And I'm not seeing any questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just say that if, if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and again email me at that advocacy at myloma.org. This webinar, again, was recorded. Uh, it will be posted on our website. We will send out an alert. Um, and you will also receive a survey uh, after this webinar, just rating on how this information was helpful to you or not. Uh, if you could just take a couple of moments to fill that out, it does help us uh, with our programming to figure out what information is, is you know, being presented, if it's being useful, if it's not useful, and that way we don't have to have webinars that uh, people don't find to be useful. Um, and so with that, oh, we do have one question. Um, it's part of the question. I will reach out to uh, you, James, to um, go ahead and answer your question for you uh, following the webinar, and we'll, we'll pick it up there. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just say thank you to Selgin again for sponsoring our webinar, um, allowing us to provide that information to you. Um, and if you have once more information, again, please email us, or you can visit us at veterans.myloma.org. Thank you all very much, and have a great day.